Good morning. Um, I want to have a thought for the week. Um, I, a number of weeks ago, I talked to you about the Israel-Hamas conflict, and obviously it's gone to new proportions as of my recording of this. And um, I saw recently that uh, it was estimated that 20,000 people have died in Gaza. And um, I certainly understand and, and uh, can fully um, get my mind around why uh, many Christians uh, support Israel in this context and in the conflict. And certainly with the uh, outlashing of Hamas, the horrible atrocities, the rape and the murder of civilians and the way that they went about uh, just the entire process, the constant agitation, all of these pieces has been utterly immoral. And Israel is responding to an ongoing threat that has been presented and continues to be presented by Hamas. Um, what I want to do is introduce something different to the equation that I have found Christians don't think much about, that they need to begin to think more about. And that is um, that as we assess some of these things, it may not change our political um, uh, energies or our political support or how we might see everything working out. But in our personal prayer lives and in our disposition toward conflict like this, we need to think about our brothers and our sisters in Christ. It's incumbent upon us to do that as Christians. Lots in the scriptures about us caring for one another. Lots in the Bible about us loving one another. There's a lot about us praying for one another. And I think we certainly need to think about how we would pray for one another as it regards um, the, the, those brothers and sisters in Christ that are caught in the middle of this. You may or may not be aware, but there are about 50,000 Palestinian Christians, um, a lot of whom live in the West Bank in particular. There's a small number, about a thousand, that live in Gaza. And um, I read a piece recently where there was an assessment, and probably a fairly accurate assessment, that uh, the Christians that uh, live in Gaza, it, it's, it's an old, one of the oldest, most historic Christian communities in the world. And it's highly likely that it'll cease to exist, either by destruction or by emigration, people leaving. And... Um, there's a witness that will be lost in that. In the midst of Hamas, in the midst of that kind of brutal form of Islam, in the midst of even a people that often supported and voted in Hamas, you do have a pocket of people who have formed a kind of witness. Here in our state, we know what it is not against some volatile, violent people at all. I don't mean that. But we know what it is to be a minority. We know what it is to be a minority witness. Um, estimates range anywhere from 3 to 7% of evangelical Christians in the state of Utah. The, the most late, the, the latest um, statistics push more towards 3% of evangelical Christians. Maybe something like 6 or 7% that are Christian in total, meaning if you combine mainline and evangelicals. You have to remember, if you put together the area of uh, Israel and the Palestinian territories and you group them all together, it's a little over 10,000, I think it's 10,600 square miles or so. Um, to put that in perspective, if you live in Utah, uh, the county to the west of us is Tuella County, uh, if you live in the Salt Lake Valley. And then the county south of that is Juab County. Both are sparsely populated, particularly Juab County. But if you put the land area of Tuella County and Juab County together, you have almost the same land area of Israel and Palestine. So it's like one eighth the size of the state of Utah. So with that in view, we can kind of demographically think, well, there might be, um, you know, uh, what it would be like to have a thousand Christians um, out in Tuella County and Juab County. Um, in a geography like that. Of course, there's a lot more population. There's about 5 million people in Palestine alone. But nonetheless, you can see that a small percentage of people, as a small percentage of people, 
um, bearing witness to the faith in uh, a section of the world that is largely either Muslim or Jewish. Uh, largely Muslim in Palestine and then largely Jewish, but there's also about 20% of Israel that's Muslim. Uh, there's an opportunity for a Christian community to bear witness. That Christian community has been fleeing because of political reasons over the years. Um, the conflict between Israel and Palestine and how that has played out certainly has impacted Bethlehem. Uh, at Christmas time, we, uh, we, you know, we just passed Christmas as you're watching this. And as we think about Christmas, you would uh, identify that with Bethlehem. Well, in 1950, Bethlehem was 86% or 85% Christian, Palestinian Christians. Now it's about 12 to 10% Palestinian Christians. What the rest is uh, are Muslim. It's flipped, and it's flipped because those Christians have gone elsewhere. This is brought on my radar in part as I was reading an article about um, one of the oldest Christian churches is a Greek, Greek Orthodox church uh, that was Saint Porphyrius Greek Orthodox Church that was much of it destroyed by missiles um, on October twentieth. Those were Israeli missiles. Um, that, that, that's in Gaza. Uh, there's not a lot of Christian presence, as I mentioned in Gaza, but there, there's a historic Roman Catholic church. There's this historic Greek Orthodox church. Um, and that was a devastating thing done to a Christian church. And we can look at that as a kind of side casualty, but the reality is in a war like this, there are a lot of side casualties. Um, and our job as Christians is not to forget the marginalized. It's not to forget the few among the many. It's not to forget those who might be sidelined and be caught in this absolute uh, storm of a war. Um, at Christmas time again, um, you know, Jesus came to and was born of a woman who was of lowly standing. And she exclaimed in poetic form in her, what's called Mary's Magnificat. She said in Luke 1, 46 through 53, my soul magnifies the Lord, my spirit rejoices in God, my savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me and holy is his name and his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. That Christianity has had an eye from its very inception in the incarnation itself to the marginalized and continues has made clear in the New Testament. You can see people praying for a Peter who is in prison in Acts 12. Um, you can see the exhortation to pray for people in prison in Hebrews. Um, you can even go into Psalms about like God's character in, in, in where the psalmist says in Psalm 146, 7, speaking of God who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. Psalm 109, 31 for he stands at the right hand of the needy one to save him from those who contemn his soul to death. I just want to highlight that in the midst of this war where we can tend to see it as Jews against Muslims, we can tend to see it as um, a sort of a, a democratic state against sort of a terrorist regime. And I understand those categories, believe me. But I want you to remember that that in the midst of this, there are Palestinian Christians and we would do well to pray for them. We would do well to pray particular in particular ways. We should pray for their peace. Uh, we should pray for their protection, that God would, would protect them. We should pray for their provision. There are brothers and sisters in Christ. We should pray that God would give them perseverance in faith through this, that God would help them um, as they probably war in their own spirit with issues of bitterness and frustration, probably to both sides of this, um, that they would come out the other side of this 
being able to bear be bearers of grace and not love and hatred. So I say that because as Christians here, our job is to keep our pulse and our eye often toward the plight of our brothers and sisters. And sometimes the, the politics can get us away and we can forget about that. So pray for the Christians of Palestine. And as we walk into a new year, um, what kind of year are they walking into? It's gonna to be tough. And so uh, those of us who are part of that eternal family, that bride of Christ, should bear them up and lift them up. Let's do that together. Take care.